All right, last thing that I'm gonna say before we dive in. Um, there is a lot of uh, passages that I wanna cover in the scripture. Normally what I do in preparation is I try and stay on one specific passion or uh, passage and just exegete that one text as best I can. Unfortunately, I have about five or six. And you say, oh, Tyler, which one did you pick? I said, yes. Uh, amen. And so just a, a few chapters that I would just encourage you, would you take the time to read this week in their full? I'm gonna be touching on, um, but I wish I could go deeper and I just can't. So here's the chapters that I want you to maybe to write down if you have notes. And would you just commit to going back this week and reading in Matthew chapter 10, from the beginning to the end of that chapter, Luke chapter 10, Acts chapter two, and then Ephesians chapter five. And again, I'm gonna be referencing them in the keynote. You can get the keynote slides and notes on the QR code as well. Um, and so we'll have that available, but those are just some chapters I want us to read in full, and I'm gonna do my best to cover them the best I can, but there is so much richness in those chapters that I just don't have time for. I was about 15 years old um, when I felt the call of God on my life to be a pastor in full-time ministry. At a very young age, I was clear this is what I was meant and made to do. Um, and so the very first year of ministry, when I finally came on staff at North, this is the very first time I was on a church staff at all, but I came on the pastoral team, I can't tell you how excited I was to finally be here. And I can't tell you how excited I was to have my first year of pastoral ministry. And it was June of 2019. And so my first year of ministry was half of 2019 and half of 2020. And man, we had a series planned for North as it was gonna be 2020 vision. It was gonna be exciting. Nothing could stop us. We were growing as a church. We were talking about a third service here. We were fired up. And the Lord in his sovereignty and his goodness gave me a nightmare of a first year of ministry. And man, did it put a steel spine in my back. It was, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I also wouldn't go back there for anything. <laughs> I had my, um, my first funeral I had to do, and it was, it was tragic and hard and personal, and it hurt, and I had never done a funeral, and I prepared for that the best I could to serve and honor the family, and it was just a hard, hard week. That was in my first year. Uh, I had my first hospital visit as a pastor, and it was incredibly personal, incredibly hard. It was incredibly even traumatic for me. It was a hard, hard time. It was during COVID and there were literal riots and protests in our city of Atlanta and across the nation. And our government officials weaponized COVID against us so that we would devour and backbite one another. There were the masks and the anti-masks. There was the anti-vaxxers and the vaxxers. There was no in-between. There was no lukewarm politics. You were either on one side or the other. And I don't know if you know this, but it didn't just stay out there. It was prevalent within the churches across the globe. People left Northlands, long time, not just strangers, people who we've had friendship for decades left the church because we said, hey, we're gonna close the doors for just a season and do live stream and, stream and parking lot services. Some of you were there and remember that. What a joy that was. Let's never do that again. <laughs> and people left the church. They said, spineless. They didn't say it to my face. They said it on the computer. Um, <laughs> Tyler, you're a spineless coward. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> I thought I was at a little bit more than that, but it's fine. I saw the comments. They, we opened up the doors of the church and then people left the church because they said, how cavalier are you? Tyler, how dare you? They left out our names, but the church is small enough. We only have a few pastors. <laughs> so if you're here and you say, well, my pastor just doesn't know how to stand for anything. I go, you're talking about either me or Greg or Tom or Armando. It's one of us. It's not hiding. You guys didn't, the other people left. You're, you're beautiful. <laughs> We said, we're gonna open up the doors, we're gonna spread out, we're gonna wear masks. And people said, I can't believe you would muzzle the church like this. We're leaving. And then we said, all right, I think it's time to take the mask off. Let's sit back like we, we used to. And people said, I can't believe how cavalier you are. It's almost as if, no matter how you led in my first year of ministry, mind you, no matter what you did, people were leaving. And my mom, in her, in her great wisdom, I think it was over Thanksgiving holiday that year. I'm just singing my mini violin and talking about how hard it is and she's listening and um, smiling at me and she looks at me and she goes, so do you still feel called to be a pastor? With that smile. Thanks, mom, when you're watching. And I said, mom, this is the best that I've got right now. 
and I told her about John chapter six, and I said, Jesus is with his disciples and with a massive gathering of people. And he, is, he has worked miracles, he gave free healthcare away, he fed the 5,000, he's feeding people for free, people are coming, he is preaching the kingdom, and they're like, take, bring us the kingdom, Jesus, you're our king, everybody's excited. And then he gets up and he preaches a great seeker sensitive message, and he goes, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you'll never have eternal life. And then just so people in the back heard him, he literally like says it again. And it says, I'll, I'll, we, we've got it on the scripture, starting in verse 66. It says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer follow him. Even the 12 that were with him, they're like, this is, they're mumbling to themselves. What a hard teaching. How difficult this is. And he goes, you're right, Judas. He goes, I'm so sorry, dude. He goes, you, we should have had speech writers like you talked about. Thomas, get on X, man. Put out an apology tweet. I don't want to get canceled. Let people know, hey, I, I apologize, and the things I said is not a reflection on what I actually believe, and it wasn't okay then when I said it, and it's not okay now when I said it. Now he turns and he looks at his disciples, and he says, you don't want to leave too, do you? And this is what I said to my mom that day. When she said, you still want to be a pastor? You still want to be in church? I said, mom, this is where I'm at. I've grown up here. I followed Jesus my whole life. And this is the, the, what Pe Simon Peter says to him. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. It's not a new thing with our generation. It's just one that's becoming more and more upfront. We, lived in com we live in compromising times. And if you're a part of the church now, or if you've grown up in the church, like was my story, you have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly underbelly of what can happen in a local church. You have seen compromised leaders fall. You have seen compromised false doctrines and false prophecies come forward. You have seen relational gossip and slander, and we're just talking about inside our community. And is anybody else, is this just me? Has anybody else experienced this in church? And so it begs the question, why do we keep coming back for more? Today and this next week, we're talking about building community, but we're not talking about building any kind of community. We're talking about building community in the local church. I wanna share with you a passage of scripture that is my, in case of emergency, Tyler, and you wanna resign and give a letter to Greg and say, I'm done being a pastor. I'm done with church. I'm tired of these people. They're bickering and they're yelling. I'm disappointed. People are leaving. In case you're like, now's the time I'm quitting, break the glass and read this passage of scripture. Here's the passage of scripture, and it'll come up on the screen. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is with his disciples and he's got a level of fame and infamy as they're going through city to city and they're hearing about this message that Jesus is preaching and he asks his disciples this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, other uh, say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he turns the page though and he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, he answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And this is my emergency text, break the glass. This is what keeps me in the guardrails. And what I would say, you should write this and underline it down to remind us of why we're here. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. This revelation that Jesus is the son of God, everything he claimed to be. And then he says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, this revelation of who I am, I will build my church, my ecclesia, and not even the gates of hell will overcome it. Amen. The reason we stay is not because it's easy and not because we're perfect and not because there's not gonna be pain in our future like there's been in our past, but the reason is, is that you and I, we have one life to live here. And Jesus is everything he claimed to be and he holds the keys to truth and to eternal life. And he said plainly, I'm building one thing, 
There's not multiple choice and multiple options. I'm building one thing and it's called my church. And at its best and its most beautiful, it is the most profound, powerful movement that this world has ever seen or will see. And not even the gates of hell, not sin, not death, not the devil or any of his demonic forces will stand against it. And so our prayer, my prayer, and what I would hope you would pray is Lord, would you help me love your church, what he calls his bride? Would you help me to love your bride like I know you love your bride? Until I am able to fully see your bride the way I know you see her. He is coming back and he is going to have presented to him a spotless, blemish-free, beautiful bride. And you and I are a part of that. And so I wanna talk about community, and yes, we would love for you to join a journey group, because I think journey groups are a great tool to help you building long-lasting, strong community, and it is needed. But before we do, I think we have to talk about the design of what the local church is supposed to be, because inside of the local church, when, when Jesus said, I have a dream and I'm building a church, in that was a type of community and a way of life that we are called to live, that we are not called to religious practices, but we are a royal priesthood called to one another. And that community, the Jesus way, is part of what it means to be a part of a local church. And so if you would uh, just give me a moment as I talk about what is the church Jesus is building. I told the slides people, it's totally okay if you don't keep up in this section. I'm on, all hopped up on Red Bull and Mentos and I am ready <laughs> to go. First thing that we have to understand about the local church, Jesus is the architect of the church. What does that mean? It means that it is his design and that he opens the doors and he closes the doors to every single church. We don't come to a city and go, what does this city need and what would be most relevant to the culture? No, Jesus had a blueprint clearly put in the New Testament writings of what a local church should be from its lordship to its leadership, to its community, to its people. And so we're not here gathering together with a bunch of leaders going, hey, what would be really cool and hip for 2024? Jesus is the one who designs, and we are simply following out a blueprint of what a local church should be. He is the one that opens the doors of the church. In Acts chapter two, we'll read in a minute, he's the one who gave birth to the church, and he is the only one that opens the door of the church. When he plants a lampstand in a city, it is for a purpose and a reason. And you'll see in Revelations chapters one to three that only he is the one who is able to pull a lampstand up, nobody else. When you see the doors of a local church closing, it's because he said so. And we see in Revelation, he says, this you guys are following by my design and my blueprint, but if you do not change and you keep walking away from what I had in mind for a church to be, I will pull up a lampstand. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against the church. I don't care what day it is, I don't care what decade it is, we are advancing. And when church doors open, we celebrate it, and when they close, we say, it must be Jesus' will because nobody else is allowed to touch the lampstands. Jesus had a lordship and leadership model in mind that the Holy Spirit of God, he is the one who is the Lord of the church while our king is making a way for us, a place for us and he'll return one day and bring his bride back to that place. In the meantime, he's left us with the Holy Spirit of God as a deposit and as the Lord of the church. In John 14, 15 and 16, he tells his disciples beforehand, I will be killed and I will resurrect and when I say I am building my church, it will come through your lives because I'm not gonna be here, but do not worry, I will not leave you as an orphan. I am sending an advocate to you. I am sending the Holy Spirit who will lead and guide you into all truth. I am perplexed by people that I talk to and they say, I grew up in the church, but my pastor never really spoke about the Holy Spirit, so I don't know much about the Holy Spirit. I don't know how you do church without talking about the Holy Spirit. I am confused by this. Because the Holy, there's, there's many things that we could talk about that are open-handed subjects. What in the world was Ezekiel on when he was looking at those creatures? What was, what's the revelation beast all about? What's, the, what's predestination? Who's going, who's coming? What's, these are, I'm happy to talk about those things over a campfire and get all spooked out. Oh, I don't know who's the antichrist. Like, ugh. <laughs> the Holy Spirit of God, please hear this. The Holy Spirit of God is not a subject for you to consider. He is a Lord that requires your submission. He is the Lord of the church. 
He is not a bronze medalist of the Godhead. He is an equal member, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I am sending my spirit to do what? To lead and guide you like I taught you. He has come now to teach you. He is the Lord of the church. And he must have rule and reign among us or we're not the church that Jesus architected and designed. He gave us leadership, Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. These were gifts by Christ himself. It's perplexing to me. We, we get all knotted up about apostles and prophets. Oh, that's a Bible teacher, that makes sense. That's an evangelist, obviously we need evangelists. That's a pastor, we know what a pastor is. An elder, that's, that's what a pastor is. A prophet, an apostle, well, now you go too far. Jesus didn't give us a weird gift. We made the gift weird. Apostles and prophets are for today. Greg is an apostle for this house. Michelle is a prophet, Sheila's a prophet of this house. What does that mean? We cannot build and establish churches. We cannot fulfill the Great Commission without being spirit-empowered and with apostles helping to establish the architect to make sure that we are following the blueprint. That's what an apostle does. What does a prophet do? A prophet goes, I, I, we've, we have heard prophetic words over Northland's house. You know what happens? We live into those prophetic words. The prophets have come to the house and go, oh, this is an oasis. Oh, this is a place where warriors come to drink. Oh, this is a place where people feel safe. Prophets said that, and you know what happened? We became an oasis, a place where warriors come to drink, and a place that is safe. You cannot pick and choose which gifts you want to have and not have, because Jesus said, I'm building my church. These are gifts that must be present in my church, in my church. And we must be Holy Spirit empowered. Acts 1, chapter, or verses one to nine, Jesus gives his disciples the great commission, which we, most, most uh, denominations would agree we all must fulfill the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospels, making disciples of all nations. But he says, wait, don't go fill the commission until what? You've received power from the Holy Spirit. You cannot do the Great Commission without the spiritual, powerful gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What is the local church? It is a place that Jesus has designed and that he is the architect and he had an intentional plan in mind where the Holy Spirit of God is Lord over the church, where there are leaders in place who are called to pour out their lives like a drink offering for his sake and for his bride's sake. And that we are a royal priesthood called to minister and preach this gospel, not just me, not just Craig, we are called to proclaim this message of the gospel of good news, to make disciples of all nations. If you've been hurt by the church, can I just say it wasn't the church? Because that's the design of the church. And if it's doing what it was designed to do, it is the most beautiful and breathtaking thing and it is worth the fight. I understand that we've been hurt. I've been hurt by these type of gatherings. But it's not a call to walk away from it, but rather lean in all the more to it and get back to what did Jesus have in mind when he said, I will build my church. And Jesus had a type of formation and a dream for the kind of community we would be. And we see that in the birth of the church in Acts chapter two, verses one to 41. Peter just goes on this unapologetic, not seeker sensitive sermon. It says 120 of them were worshiping together. Fire comes down from heaven like a tongue of fire, rests on each of their heads. They begin preaching and speaking in tongues. There's a loud rushing wind that goes through the city, a sound of a loud wind going through the city, and people begin to rush out of their homes to figure out what in the world is going on. And 120 people pour out speaking in tongues, and many begin to mock them because they have no idea what is going on, and they're angry about the disruption. And, and some of them say, these people are drunk. So Peter gets up and he says, we're not drunk because it's nine in the morning, how dare you? <laughs> and then he begins to preach a message that is not seeker sensitive. He said, this is exactly what the prophet Joel prophesied when he said, my spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Your sons will dream dreams. Your old men will see visions. This is exactly what we have been preparing and waiting for, for a Messiah to come into salvation. And he walked among you and he stood in front of you and he preached about the kingdom and you rejected him for it. You crucified him. You murdered the son of God. Now repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. And 3,000 people were added to the church that day from that preach. 
And then I wanna pick up in verse 42 because I wanna talk about the kind of community that I believe Jesus had in mind, not just for them, but for you and me today. Acts chapter two, verse 42 to 47. These 3,120, which just kept growing daily, it says they, the people, it wasn't required of them, it wasn't a program that they were forced into, it's that after they heard this message and they were pierced in the heart and convicted by what had happened and what they had done and how they missed Christ, they surrendered their life to Jesus and it says, from there they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled in awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles and all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone in the community who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in their temple, uh, meet together in the temple courts like this corporate gathering or they broke bread together in their homes like a house church, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They devoted themselves not to a bunch of tasks, but to a way of living, a lifestyle. And in this lifestyle, it was a people devoted to the apostles' teaching, to opening up the scriptures like we're doing today, to fellowshipping like with one another here and in our homes together like in a journey group. They had meals in their homes. They, they demonstrated hospitality. And they took communion together like we've done today and again in our homes together. Miracles and the gifts of God were at work among them. The power of God was breaking out in a number of ways. They fought for unity and care for one another. In a time that is compromising and in a time where it is easy to divide, we must fight for unity. It's not the same as uniformity. It is a call. Even though we are different, we are united by this, the blood of Christ. Generosity was poured out. They had constant daily gatherings like this and in homes. And they worshiped together. And because of the healthy expression of what the church is supposed to be, because they lived like this and devoted themselves to this lifestyle and way, they grew in their numbers daily. Not because the message was nuanced and pretty and relevant for the culture, but because it was such a compelling way of life that they had never experienced before. And they said, we must have it. So they grew. We hear it said that the church is not a building like the one that we're in, it's a people. And I think that that's a fair thing to say, but I think it's an incomplete statement. The church is not just people who go, I'm a Christian, I've said yes to Jesus, I have salvation. All you need is your individual confession in faith and through his grace that you need him and you are saved. But that doesn't mean you're a part of his church. Because the church is not just a group of people who say, I have salvation, and so when I do coffee with my friends, just me, I don't need this corporate gathering, I don't need the lights, I don't need a worship team, I don't need children's ministry, I don't need any of these things. All I want is my two friends, and that we're gonna call church, and that's all I have for the rest of my life. That's not church. Small fraction of it. The church is not up for your design or my design or what's fitting best for our preferences and our disposition. The church is Jesus's design. And so when we say the church is a people, the more completed statement is the church is a group of people committed to a way of life with one another. That's the church. What's the way of life? What we just read here. Do you have that in your life? And if you don't, let's talk today about how we get that. It's not a bunch of tasks that we do, but rather it's a way of life that we commit to one another and ourselves in the practices like we saw in Acts chapter two, verse 42 to 47. You still with me? All right, so then the question is, is how do we build community the Jesus way? How do, we, how do we experience what we see in Acts 2, this explosion of revival, the power of God breaking out, people being added to our numbers daily, and that we are growing spiritually and that we have rich community? How do we build the Jesus way? And what I love about Jesus in this whole sense of a rabbi, it's not just that they preached lessons with words, but they demonstrated the lessons out with their lives. Jesus didn't just speak about the ecclesia, he demonstrated in his three years of ministry with his 12 disciples how to do church. And so I wanna talk about uh, uh, some rule of life elements that I see in the life of Jesus. Jesus had his three friends, he had his 12 disciples or his apostles, he had a community of 72, and then what we just read about the 120. I wanna talk about Jesus' three, Jesus' 12, Jesus' 72, 
and Jesus is 120 plus. And from there, I wanna talk about now, how do we build our lives like him, the one who's architecting this thing called the church? Jesus and his three. Jesus had three disciples that were a part of the 12, Peter, James, and John, but we see in the scripture that there's multiple accounts where he pulls away from the crowd and he pulls away from even his 12 disciples, but he says, hey, Peter, James, John, come with me. We have some stuff to do. And so you can pull them up here. You'll see it in Mark chapter five, as he heals uh, Jairus' daughter, she dies and he brings her back to life. We see it in the passage of the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus demonstrates his glory and its fullness. And he's talking with Elijah and Moses and Peter, James and John are there to witness. And we see it in the garden of Gethsemane on one of the worst nights of his life, a sleepless night, he is praying and he brings his three closest friends to him. We see, if you're not familiar with these passages, Jesus is working through a crowd and ministering and healing people left and right. And this man, Jairus, comes and says, Jesus, you must heal my daughter. She's dying at my house. And while on the way there, a messenger comes and tells Jairus, hey, leave the teacher alone. Your daughter's died. And Jesus says, no, no, take take me to her. And he goes away from the crowd following Jairus and he leaves his disciples, but he says, Peter, James, John, I want you to come with me. And he brings them and he gets there and the house is filled with people who are weeping and mourning, obviously so, and there's crying and tears and Jesus clears the whole house except for five people, Jairus and his wife, Peter, James, and John. He speaks to the little girl and he heals her. But this is what's so peculiar about that passage. He says in verse 43, he gave them strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat, the little girl. Why would he let them in the room and then be like, don't tell anybody? Because Jesus had a group of friends that he was going to confide in. He's going, this is not for everybody. I didn't do this to, to flex and to gain social points. I did this because I wanted you to see a part of my life that'll come later on for the rest of everybody else. But I wanted you to be the first to know. On the Mount of Transfiguration, it's one of the Jesus' highlights where he is completely clothed in his full glory. Peter loses his mind and fangirls so hard. Moses and Elijah show up and he's like, are you seeing this? Get some leaves and some sticks. We're not going back to those friends of ours. We're staying right here. We're gonna stay here and we're gonna build tabernacles for these three. And while he's going nuts, a voice from heaven comes and says, that's my son with whom I'm well pleased. Whatever he tells you, you should do. He comes out of that space. Jesus the glory comes back in their, in their back just with Jesus as they know him. And then again, he tells them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Why would he do that? Because there's some people that you celebrate and do life with. Your wins are their wins. Your losses are their losses. And Jesus goes, yeah, yeah, the, the others will hear about this, but for right now, I just wanted my bros to know. That's the Passion Translation. <laughs> He's in Gethsemane. And I don't know if you're familiar with this story, he's praying and he goes three times, he comes back to his friends and they're falling asleep. So he keeps waking waking up. They do nothing really to minister to him. But isn't that the point? The point is not that Jesus needed wise words from them. He was literally being uh, ministered to by an angel. He, he, he's praying with his heavenly father. He doesn't need them to give wise words of comfort. He just wants his friends present with him. I don't, I don't need you to give me something. I just want you here with me. Do you have your three? See, the gift of having three like this in your life, there's three gifts that come with it, confession, care, and celebration. We need a culture, a a, a redemption on this idea of confession and repentance. We, We need to be able to tell people our fears, our pain, and our sins, and to say, hey, I'm not doing well here, but I need somebody to know. Will you help me? We need care, we need people who guard us and serve us and to pray for us. We need, as I said, celebrating our wins and mourning our losses. We live in a culture that conditions us for isolation. In other words, two things of of how you're being conditioned right now to isolate yourself. If you are vulnerable, they'll weaponize it against you. Don't show them who you are or they will cancel you. It's much easier to hide. Don't tell them what you really think because what you think is going to be weaponized in today's culture. But have you noticed that hypocrisy is monetized and incentivized? Hypocrite just means mask. Put on the filters, turn on the social media and let people know, hey guys, I'm just whipping up some cookies right now while my kids are running in the background and frolicking. Buy my e-course, I'll tell you how to be a great mom like I am. 
I'll tell you how to be the world's best dad. I'll tell you how to be the business. Show me your best. And honestly, that best is so embellished. It's easier to hide and put up a mask because you can make money doing it. And it's much harder to tell people who you are because they'll weaponize it against you. And Jesus said, I'm not here to live in such an upside down culture. I wanna teach you a new way of living. You must be vulnerable and transparent. Do you have your three? Maybe a question to ask is, who is allowed to really see you? Do you have, don't tell me who your closest friends are. Are those closest friends people that you're able to truly be vulnerable with? Jesus had them and you should too. I gotta move on. Jesus had his 12, I don't have time to read it fully, but in Matthew chapter 10, verses one to four, it'll come up there. Jesus had his 12 disciples, he names them all right there, and he gives them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. And then later on in that chapter that I want you to read this week, he speaks about going and proclaiming the kingdom of God in every city. And those who receive you speak peace over their house, and those who reject the message, just wipe the dust off of your feet and move on. Proclaim an uncompromised gospel to the cities that will hear you. And so the reason I bring this up is because in just a moment, we'll talk about Jesus's 72 and he gives the same commission. This wasn't a, a call just to the special where he gave some of them authority, but for everybody else, we're just gotta do it on our own. No, he, he's building a type of community and then he presents a culture in the 72, but we'll talk about that in a moment. For right now, I wanna talk about the gifts that come with having your 12. Um, I'm rolling with a couple guys right now. We've been rolling together for about six months. Before that, I was with a, a group for um, about three and a half years, and we just kept growing, and so we split into groups of 12 again. And I gotta tell you that not as a pastor, as a Christian and as a human being, I've never sp experienced such spiritual formation and discipleship in my entire life than rolling with these guys. I'm not even the leader of the group. There's other guys, we're kind of co-leading it together. I'm not there to pastor 12. I'm there to minister with my friends and brothers in arms. And in that, there's a gift that comes with the 12. We see discipleship, we see spiritual growth, we see a pursuit of life purpose, we see a discovery of gifts and calling, and we see a strengthening of core values. We, there's a myth in understanding and practicing religion. We've reduced this idea of church and religion down to a certain amount of tasks that we do, accumulating enough knowledge and longevity of how long we walk out this faith. Oh, I've been serving Jesus for 12, 15, 20 years. Oh, you must be mature. You must be really spiritually formed. Religion says, do some tasks like reading the Bible, praying, giving to charities, do those things. And if you do them enough for a long enough time, then you're going to be spiritually mature. And that's not what Jesus invites us to. True discipleship and spiritual formation is not that, but rather it is a people committed to a Jesus way of life and committed to one another. Fulfill all the laws and the prophets and all the things that we should be doing by loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. How is that? By not questioning the design, but rather submitting to the design of Jesus and by loving your neighbor, one another, as ourselves. Do you have the 12 in your life? We'll talk about how to get them if you don't. I wanna talk about Jesus and his 72. And I'm gonna read these passages of scripture, uh, Luke chapter 10, verses one and two. And again, I have to skip down and read eight and 12. But I wanna read these passages and then I wanna talk about Jesus and the 72. And I want you to take note that the same commissioning that he gives to his 12 disciples, he gives to the 72. If you read Matthew 10 and Luke 10, it's commissioning 72 people in the 12, but the commissioning is just completely identical in so many ways. And, and so what I wanna talk about is Jesus had his community of 12, but then he exploded with a culture and a way of life. And that's what this is here. It says, after the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like a lamb among wolves. That sounds good, Jesus, like a lamb among wolves. Then he says this, skipping down. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, which means there's the assumption that we're not always gonna be welcomed with our message, Go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe off from our feet as a warning to you, yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. And then Jesus said, I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of Sodom 
then of the town. And he repeats that and adds Gomorrah in there for Matthew, in Matthew chapter 10. Um, we live in a time of compromise, meaning slick and nuanced is far better and choosing and mincing your words appropriately is the way to go if you're gonna survive in the culture. But we're not trying to survive in that culture. We are counter the culture. The gift of 72 is that Jesus preaches a kingdom counter culture. Unapologetically, he is preaching an uncompromised message of the kingdom and he's not compromising for anyone or anything. He says it plainly, you think that I've come to bring peace, I've brought a sword and it will divide a man from his father, a daughter from her mother and a daughter-in-law from her mother-in-law. Meaning, if you're, even your closest family gets in the way between you choosing the kingdom that I am preaching and the eternal life that I am offering and your family, choose wisely and you should choose eternal life. Uncompromising, uncompromising. And he talks about a culture within the 72, not a message that I should preach, but a message that our church, that the community of believers would preach, that he came with grace and love and he also came full of truth, never diminishing this reality. He said, do not let even a ounce of yeast of the teachings of the Pharisee come into our culture. Don't let dead religion come in here. Because if you do and you compromise, it's no longer the kingdom of God, it's something else entirely. He warned them not to lead like the political leaders of their time. Don't let an ounce of a political spirit come in here. We will have no king but Jesus. Paul said, an apostle of Christ, he says, do not let even a hint of sexual immorality come among you. Not greedy, not impure, not coarse joking, not an ounce of it. There are men and women right now who are claiming to be the church and they're ordaining the LGBTQ community to be pastors and ministers in the gospel. And the Bible makes it plain and clear that that way of living is what's called sexual immorality. And I just wanna say, if you're watching, you're part of the LGBTQ community, or if you're here and you're part of the LGBTQ community, this is not a message that says, hey, your way of life is so foreign and unacceptable, you don't fit in here. What I am saying and what the Bible says plainly, and I'm simply proclaiming it, is that all of us were born into iniquity. So please hear me. I was born sexually broken. I was born a certain way. And Jesus, like when he meets the woman at the well, he says, I, he tells her everything about her life and all the things that she did. And he still offers her an invitation, hey, come and drink what I have to offer, a new way of life. But he does not allow her to live like she used to. The, the rich young ruler, give everything that you have to the poor, come and follow me. Jesus isn't interested in what's going on in your life in terms of a certain type of brokenness is not gonna end the kingdom. He's saying all people are broken. I, I, I convinced myself through religious practice that because I didn't have sex before marriage, I was considered pure because I did a certain practice and refrained from it. And yet I was sexually broken because I objectified women and used them as my plaything. I used my humor and my charisma and my athleticism and any other tools I had, gifts from God, and I used them not to bring life, not to celebrate the Imago Day on these girls. I used them to my goodwill and pleasure. And when I met Jesus, he showed me grace, love, and truth. And he said, Tyler, I love you. And I gave you gifts to use for my will and my good pleasure. And he showed me everything about my life. And he said, and I still died for you. And at the same time, he said, that old person of who you are, you take him out in the street and you crucify him because he is not fit in my culture. That's truth crucifying myself, not I that live, but Christ is within me. Take your political party, take your sexual preferences, and if it does not line up with the design that God has clearly stated in the New Testament, you are to crucify it and put it to death. Pick up your cross and follow him. It is a message of grace and mercy, but it requires truth. Please go read Matthew chapter 10 and Luke 10 because he speaks very plainly, if you want to find life, you are going to have to lose your life. What life? The life that you once were. You died and now you are born again to new life and only you can make a decision to say, am I going to believe him when I said, I've come to give you life and life to the full and that old life is only gonna steal from you, destroy you and kill you. It is a culture of death out there and whatever they're promising you, they are liars. I gotta move on because I'm already over time.
Jesus and his 120. Um, just for the sake of time, we'll skip through the, the passage, but bring them up quickly. I just want to show you the reference point. Acts chapter 1, verse 15, it references the 120. And then in Acts chapter 2, it was the 120 that were together. They were filled with the Spirit like we spoke about. And then further on in Acts chapter 2, uh, we see that 3,000 were added to that number daily after Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost. What I want to point out about the 120 is Acts chapter 8, verse 1. A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. We serve an apostolic God. That word apostle means sent one. He sent us his best in Jesus to come and seek and save that which is lost. And then Jesus commanded us to be the sent ones. We are called to go out. And as we grow a church culture like the one that we are in, we are called to take this culture and to be commissioned out. Um, right now we're seeing in culture, and it's, it's, the culture is, is a liar, as I already said, and it's casting fear. It's saying to the young millennials, to the Gen Z, and to the Gen Alpha, uh, you're never gonna be homeowners. You should probably not get married and you should not have kids because they're expensive. And you're not gonna be able to afford it based off where the economy would go. That's completely anti the Bible. And also, do not live with a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. There is a bright future for you, Gen Z. He is going to provide for you. Your heavenly Father provides for you, not our economy. Please do not do this, though. Because of the threat of fear, people are leaving their community. I, I, I talked with a guy, great guy, loves Jesus. I know the Lord's gonna bless him wherever he goes. He said, I'm actually moving with my newlywed wife to Nebraska. I said, what's in Nebraska? He said, nothing but cheaper living. People choosing to leave their community for the sake of convenience and comfort. Don't give in to that spirit of fear, Gen Z. Fight for community. Life is filled with problems. There's the problem of can I be a homeowner and can I have community? I promise you fighting for community is way harder to build. If you find it and you start building it, don't give it up for anything. That's for free. At the same time, at the same time, we have to recognize that our community is an apostolic community and we serve ascending God. And so we don't say, oh, I'm gonna root myself here in Norcross and in Peachtree Corners and the only way that I'm moving or leaving Northlands is if God calls me away and he arrests me with a crazy dream and an audible voice from heaven. I'm not leaving unless God arrests me. Paul preached and he said, I'm gonna preach the gospel in Asia and the Holy Spirit restrained him and said, don't go, I'm not calling you there. So instead of saying we're here unless the Lord calls me, the posture that I believe that we're called to grow in Northlands is that we are restrained back by the Spirit of God. We're going, and the only thing keeping us here is the Holy Spirit says stay just a while longer. In other words, we're all going, just not yet. Because we serve a God who sends out his best. I think for Northlands, we have spent the last 25 years building a culture and we have been painstakingly making sure that we are following the design that Christ had for the local church. But I believe Northlands, it's time to work in our hearts the commissioning out of this culture, to be sent ones. I think that's gonna be the, the, the position of the next 25 to 30 years. And so I close with this and apologize for going slightly over. Are you in a Jesus community? That's my question for you. Do you have two or three people who see you? I love that you're reading the scriptures and that you're praying and that you're giving generously, but do you have a group of people that are, that's smaller than this, that group of 12 that you're doing life with, that, that know you, that celebrate you, that are helping you discover and strengthen your gifts, that you're walking with them as Jesus walked with them. He gave three years of his life just to these 12 men. Do you have that in your life? Because it's offered to you. It's what the church is called to be. If you have that, then I would ask you, is it aligned with Jesus's design? Meaning, don't tell me your closest three friends. Tell me, are you confessing to them openly? This is where I am, would you help me? Can they see you? If you don't have your 12, that's why we use journey groups. It, journey groups for us is not a silver bullet. In other words, if you're going like, oh, I wanna find my three best friends. If you just sign up for a journey group, we can give you all of those things. That is not possible. You do not find great community and you don't join a program to find great community. You build great community. Journey groups are like hammer and nails. They are a tool that we use to help you in the search to build with people. 
So I'm gonna invite you to use the QR code and to check out a journey group. And if you don't have your three or 12, join a community group because that's the very first step for you to build your community. When you get into that community group, ask the Lord, Lord, is there anybody here that I can open up my life to? And if you see somebody that is a possibility, invite that person or them and their spouse into your house for a dinner or to coffee and say, hey, I'd love to just get to know you a little bit more outside of the journey group context. Can we do lunch or a dinner together? And begin to build relationships. I have close friends in my life. They didn't come because of journey groups. They came because we did life together and we intentionally showed vulnerability and transparency. And it's not this rocket science. You can have this. You are more than able to do it. To build your 12, man, I, I would encourage you to start a group. Invite people into your home. Invite guys that are in the same season of life. Invite ladies that are in the same season of life and say, hey, let's walk together for maybe a year in an intensive. Doesn't matter really what practices you give yourself to, just build chemistry, the 12 of you together. Do you have 72 in your life? We live in a compromised time and in a compromised culture. We need each other more than ever. A lone ranger is a dead ranger. Don't be in isolation. Be in a culture like this where we watch each other's back. It is not just one person preaching the kingdom of heaven. It is the entire church community going out into the streets and preaching this gospel. And if they receive us, the kingdom of God comes near to their home. And if they don't, we step back and we go on to the next town. But we do that. Don't church hop. Don't treat church like a consumeristic thing. It is a, it is a call for spiritual contribution, not spiritual consumerism. Find a church to be plugged into and give your life away. It's well worth it. And then remember as that church grows and becomes the 120, we must have a sending spirit in us more than because what God has given us here is too rich of a gift for the, us to keep it here in one church building. We are called to disciple the nations. Give your life away. The gift of the 120 is that it is a life full of purpose. It is a life of multiplication. It is a life of generational legacy. Because of what we decide to do in spreading this culture, it will impact our grandkids and our grandkids' grandkids. Not because they'll remember your name or my name, but because they will know the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, because of the work that we give ourselves to. This is the church that Jesus is building, and this is the invitation that we're inviting you to for this week and next week. Begin the journey of building this rich community. The church is the three, the 12, the 72, the 120, the 3,000 into the ends of the earth. The church is not a building, it is a people like us devoted to a lifestyle and to one another. Amen.